I've been told that I tend to favor this side of the audience. Now there's nobody sitting there. So I'm going to do the opposite of what you're supposed to do in golf. And I'm actually going to turn my seat <laughs> towards the major mass of people. Anyway, I think I have something wrong with my neck. And I tend to favor not looking over to the left because it hurts. So is this weird? Do I look all askew? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding around. Anywho, if I'm not looking at you, it's just because I have chronic football issues. So um, I mean to make eye contact. Anyway, I've got uh, two announcements. Uh, one that I don't want to forget for sure, because last time I forgot, we had a handout, and I never end up saying anything. Um, we have uh, Heather Burnett, who designs these amazing graphics for us that we use both for our digital marketing and uh, invitations to the pig roast, but we also have a physical copy. And you have, yeah, there you go, Isaiah. And it's on your little tables, and there's also ones on the way out if you need more. We'd actually like you to take all of the ones that we have, even if you don't think you can pass them all out, take a nice little stack of them, and then if you have anybody that you want to give one of these to, you know, they're nice cardstock. You can put it on your refrigerator. So big family pig roast. Again, that's August 7th, 11 to 2. Uh, I think we're doing 160 pounds or 150 pounds of brisket this year because last time we did 80 and it went in 30 minutes. So, and it's good brisket. It's not just any kind of brisket. It's, you know, kind of Texas barbecue. There'll be a 100-foot water slide going down, and I usually partake in that. And then this big bouncy house, too. Very family-friendly. I think we're having uh, some uh, DJed music this year, potentially, and, uh, and like an ice cream truck or something like that. So it should be a really great time. And it's a fantastic time to invite your non-Christian friends. It's a very friendly, very safe um, church event. Two years ago, last time we had this, we had about 50 people that were, at least from what I could tell, uh, not Christians, not churched at all, and had no connection to anybody in church. They just showed up randomly. So it's a pretty good opportunity to get to know people in our neighborhood and uh, show them that uh, church is not what they think it is, and it's not what they've heard it is either. It's so much better. So um, that being said, uh, we constantly have new people coming. You're very welcome here at Boone's Ferry, and uh, I don't know if we end up getting a slide or not. Yes, no? Okay. So there is a, um, one of those little images uh, as a, Ben, what do you call it? Say it out loud. QR. Code. QR. <laughs> I want to say RFID, but it's QR code. Just take your phone, most of your phones, if you just put it on your picture mode uh, and put it right in front of that, it'll immediately take you to a link that will allow you to subscribe to our newsletter. Now, many of you probably don't want to have one more thing you get emailed. We actually really keep it to a minimum. Um, I can't even remember the last time a newsletter went out, so <laughs> you're not going to get a whole lot of spam emails from us. It's about, at the most, during, during heavy church season, which is not the summer, about twice a month that you'll get some kind of information. And oftentimes it's repeat, but usually there's something in there that you needed to know, wanted to know, and wanted to be updated about. Um, we'll be doing you know, our financial update in September. That'll be on there. So you want to be subscribed if you consider yourself part of uh, Boone's Ferry. It's really easy to do uh, with your phone in that way. Um, I don't have any other announcements, so I'm going to go ahead and pray, and then we'll get right into the Word today. <laughs> Heavenly Father, I was thinking just the other day, now that many of the restrictions are lifted, um, that one of the things that I loved most about the restrictions and the pandemic uh, was that it caused us to realize that being able to meet freely in person in public in a church service was not something to be taken for granted and that that freedom um, is beginning to slip away from us here in America. And I saw and got to experience how our congregation, I don't think we were ever per se going through the motions, but it was like it was the very opposite. We were excited to come and worship and um, grateful to be here, and it even changed the tone of our voices and the power with which we were worshiping, and I just ask that that would continue, and that we would see being able to open your word and hear from what you are teaching um, that's often controversial and exactly the opposite of what the world teaches us, that we'd be thankful for that, and that we'd remember that it's not a freedom that we should be taking for granted, that we're doing this in the open and without having to hide, and I pray all these things in Jesus' name, amen. So, um, I would say we'd be in Ephesians uh, 6 today, but we're really jumping all over the place. Uh, if you want to kind of turn your, your Bible to one passage, it would be Ephesians 6, verse uh, 1 through 4. Just continuing right along in what we were learning about. Last week, we learned about marriage roles, controversial topic. Today, we're going to be 
um, studying another controversial topic, and that's actually disciplining children. And uh, I realized something about controversial topics. Uh, I don't care that they're controversial. <laughs> I don't care at all. I really don't. Um, and it's because, uh, honestly, if we started caring about not preaching on controversial topics, there would be much of the Bible that we wouldn't even be able to talk about. Everything is controversial these days, and uh, so we're going to talk about it. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I want to tell you a little story from my childhood. This is not something I remember. I was just a little baby crawling around, uh, literally couldn't speak yet, and it's a story my mom tells me uh, about myself. And um, my dad was in seminary in Germany in Tübingen School of Theology, and he had a colleague that came over probably to study Hebrew vocab or something like that, and uh, he observed something that I was doing, and evidently what I was doing is I would, my mom had plopped me on the couch to say hi to this uh, colleague of my dad's, a fellow student, and I got off the couch and crawled over. Germans have a lot of houseplants. I, we have some houseplants. I think it's only because I was uh, raised there, but I, it's just not something that you see as much of in America, but every German household has a lot of household plants, the real household plants in big pots, and I would go over and I would dig uh, in the dirt, and it would get everywhere, and so my mom slapped my hand, put me back on the couch, and said, don't do that, and as soon as she was not paying attention, or maybe even earlier, I got back down and started digging in the dirt again, and my mom said her hand hurt from slapping mine, and mine must have been beet red, and it didn't matter. I just kept doing it. And the uh, uh, fellow student looked at me and said to my parents, that little kid's either going to be a man of God or a criminal. <clears throat> and the only thing he got wrong about that was the either part. I turned out to be both. I managed it somehow. Uh, not even joking. This isn't the time to tell that story. We've got too much to cover. But I have both been a criminal and consider myself now very much a man of God. And so... Um, if you had known me when I was a kid, and even if you know me now, I'm probably one of the most strong-willed people that I've ever met. I was definitely the most strong-willed kid I've ever heard of. Even now, I've heard of strong-willed kids, but not ones where it almost seems that uh, discipline doesn't work. Uh, but I'm here to tell you that it does, and it does in some of the most theologically powerful ways. For example, I was in a very dark place in, in college, my criminal days, my rebellious days, and I'm not, I joke about it, but I'm not, uh, I regret it deeply, and God has had to deal with some of that regret and shame and guilt that I've had, and it's gone now, but it was, it was a terrible thing, it's not a good thing, but I remember, I think I've said this before, watching a Tom Hanks movie whenever that came out called Road to Perdition, and uh, perdition is hell, it's like uh, consequences for being a mob boss, a mob gangster, hitman, whatever he was. And I remember thinking, I know that there are consequences for doing wrong. I know it. I know it in my heart. And part of the reason why I know why is that my dad never ultimately let me win as a strong-willed kid. Uh, he kept disciplining, kept at it. And, uh, and so I knew from a young age that there are consequences for wrongdoing. Um, I tended to think as a kid, well, I can absorb those consequences. I don't know um, if you remember how you thought as a kid, but I remember distinctly thinking, um, I know exactly what's going to happen to me if I do this thing I'm not supposed to do. And so I would weigh in my mind, is it worth it? I'm going to do this thing, and there's a certain value that I perceive in it, and then I'm going to get this consequence. And most of the time, I'd be like, yeah, I can take that. I want to do this anyway. So I was premeditatively disobedient as a child. But I always got a consequence. My dad never let me off the hook. Um, one time that consequence was... Uh, uh, I'm missing a football game. Actually, I'm, he may have relented on that because I begged him and he saw that I was really, really sorry. But it was about the scariest thing ever. To, I think it was a popcorn or football game that because of my behavior, I was going to let my team down and miss a game and just felt so horrible. A few games in football seasons. And what that did in my adulthood is um, there was this sense from childhood that there are consequences for doing something wrong. And I knew the kinds of things that I was doing wrong now we're going to lead to really serious consequences in the future. And there was this fear of perdition. I remember watching that movie and thinking, i got to stop my life. Tom Hanks, this character, needs to stop doing what he's doing. He's going to lose his family. He's going to lose everything. And so there was a sense in which it really um, put the fear of, of the consequence of sin in my, in my heart as an example. And the consequence of sin is death. And so I want to actually read to you, uh, by the way, the Proverbs... Um, if you're a parent of children, or if you just want wisdom, the Proverbs are unbelievable. This is um, Proverbs 23, I think, and it says, uh, Proverbs 23, verse 13, do not withhold discipline from a child, 
If you strike him with a rod, he will not die. If you strike him with a rod, you will save his soul from Sheol. I don't think Solomon is saying that you can save your children through spanking them. I don't think that's it. I think it's more like what I illustrated with that idea that uh, disciplining children tells a story about who God is. And you can either tell a false story that he's a God that just lets the guilty go unpunished, which is the exact opposite of what he actually says. Let me read this too. Every time I say something about God, um, unless I can quote it by memory, I'd like to back it up from Scripture so that you know what I'm saying. And here's the Lord's self-definition, talking to Moses about who he is. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. So he doesn't clear the guilty. He doesn't just let people off the hook. Uh, we've become used to as Christians that many of the consequences of our wrongdoing, as sometimes even all of them, fell on Jesus. And so we know that we have been cleared of guilt and our, our guilt is no longer going to be punished because it's been punished in Jesus. But um, even when sin is punished in Jesus, sometimes there are consequences. You could be a murderer, be forgiven and go to heaven, but you still may be in prison. You still may even get the death penalty and God may not save you from that consequence. So consequences even for Christians exist, and consequences uh, for children end up telling a story about who God is. That's why it's so important to actually know what godly discipline looks like. That's the number one reason. Um, yes, behavior modification is important, chaperoning your children, helping them understand how to be a you know, future functioning member of society, never discipline your kids, then they might be shocked when they get fired for not doing what their boss says. But that kind of thing is a lower level importance than what you're actually telling them about who God is. I learned from my dad uh, something about God the Father. I, I learned that God the Father loves me. I learned that God the Father will discipline me. And he will discipline me uh, in order to change my behavior. That's the goal of the discipline. It's not a slap on the wrist. It's whatever it takes to stop me going the direction that I was going in. And I'm not going to get away with it. Um, I learned that from my dad. I learned from my dad that even after he disciplines me, he still loves me because he would hug me afterwards. In fact, I learned that he disciplines because he loves me. And I've taken that into my relationship to my own children. So I learned a lot about God the Father. I learned that God the Father won't abandon me from my dad because my dad never abandoned me. Now think about all the different things that you might learn about God the Father if you didn't have a good father or a good mother. A lot of friends of mine had fathers that just weren't in the picture, weren't around, um, were, were absent, or had abandoned them altogether. That creates this lens through which we see who God the Father is. God can help clear that lens back up, but you don't really want to start your children off with a lens that's foggy or obscuring who God actually is. And so that's why, if you don't take anything else away from this, recognize that what you do in relationship to how you parent your children tells a story about who God is, and it's either true or it's false. Um, another little disclaimer I want to give you is I don't, by any stretch of the imagination, consider myself a perfect father. I could tell you five or six areas that I struggle with that I really need to grow in and come into line with what I'm even about to tell you. Um, I really want, another thing is, you know, a lot of young parents, uh, millennial parents these days, you'll see tweets and memes about... Um, Basically, all the same message, like, don't judge me. Uh, don't judge my parenting, you know. And um, it's really easy to judge parenting, look at what they're doing wrong, what they're doing right. And uh, so we ought not to do that, right? That's a stumbling block to parents. We ought to encourage them. And on the other side, it's really easy to basically make it sound like we're all just finding our own way. There's no, you know, truth about how to parent, and there's no correct way to do it. And basically, uh, it's, oh, we're all stabbing in the dark, and it's really, really... Uh, complicated and, and, and basically like who knows what to do with children. That's kind of the other side. Uh, scripture teaches a lot about how to raise children. I don't think it's that difficult to understand or that complicated to apply. I think it's hard to be consistent in it. I think some of the, what scripture teaches about parenting is also hard to accept. But we want to reject the idea that it's so complicated. God's promises and God's teaching and God's instruction about how to raise our children really actually works. I'm watching it happen with my own children. Now, I'm going to be speaking mostly from the experience of raising children one to eight, about a decade's worth of parenting. 
Um, I think some of the things I say will uh, apply to you if you're parenting older children or maybe if your parents, if your children are even adults, uh, or if you are a grandparent now and have adult children raising children. I think it'll apply too. However, I want you to let you know that um, this is mostly targeted towards parents with, with younger children. And so some of the things I say just simply don't apply to teenagers, and I think you'll know uh, what does and what doesn't. Um, at the same time, uh, Steve has older children. I thought, you know what, uh, if I'm team teaching this with Steve, might as well have Steve teach uh, about um, parenting teenagers and, and things like that because he has so much more experience. So um, if you feel like this sermon is lopsided, it will be corrected and balanced by future sermons as well. So with that being said, um, th- actually, you know what, there's a second piece to it. The first piece is the way that we parent tells a story about who God is. And it gives our children a lens through which to view God. And that lens is either obscured or clear. Uh, The second one is that how we parent, and I don't mean to be exaggerating, but it's really true. uh, It will actually either build up a society or tear it down. That's how important parenting is. You won't see that just in one generation. It takes a couple generations to start seeing uh, how parents parented their kids. Um, But I came across this verse in Ecclesiastes and it just, it really kind of blew my mind considering what's going on today. You probably all read about the recent uh, spike in crime in major cities and across the U.S. And so I started looking at some statistics for um, if that was also true in Portland. I assumed it was. And uh, just one statistic that it ought to be alarming. We're on course to surpass a thousand violent gun crimes in Portland. Unheard of. Huge spike from, uh, from past years. So crime is on the rise, right? You might think, well, what on earth does that have to do with parenting? Well, listen to this. This is uh, scripture telling us why crime is on the rise in America. It's not complicated. Listen to this. Ecclesiastes 8, verse 11. Because the sentence against an evil deed is not executed speedily, the heart of the children of man is fully set to do evil. Let me read that one more time. Because the sentence against an evil deed is not executed speedily, The heart of the children of man is fully set to do evil. In other words, when you begin to focus on phantom justice issues, where there's no real criminal, there's no real crime being committed, there's nothing that can really be pursued specifically for justice, no one's going to get put behind bars, it's just an opinion of one group of people versus an opinion of other people, and and then you relax laws about actual criminal behavior with real criminals doing real criminal things, and you you just basically slow justice from happening, what ends up happening is people become convinced in their hearts that now is the time to do more evil. And it's not because, oh, I want to be so evil, because it's the perceived benefit of doing evil things. Just like when I was a little criminal kid, thinking about, I can do this thing and get away with it. Imagine now if my parents hadn't regularly and speedily disciplined me for that. Well, I would have been convinced as an adult. You don't want a guy like me becoming a mob boss. You just don't. You don't want someone who has a really strong will taking that strong will and turning it towards evil. But that's what's happening in our society. You see it across our nation. We've relaxed laws. More lawlessness has come in. And there's this broken foundation that started in parenting where people have rejected authority as wrong. Who are you to tell me what's right and what's wrong? Let's defund the police. I I hate authority. Okay? And there's more to it than that, but you see this happening in our nation, and it started with parenting, started with parenting. And just to clear thing, one thing up regarding um, judging, you know, generations and things, um, I'm fully aware of how entitled millennials are, and, uh, and, and, and the kinds of ways that I've witnessed people parenting these days, I think it's going to make for an even worse generation to come up, you know. But one of the things I think about is who, uh, you know, Millennials are oftentimes raising monsters. <laughs> That's the way I look at it. I'm like, who raised these millennials? Who raised them? You know, you need to think about this started long before this generation. This has been generations in the making that we're at this place in our nation where uh, basically people are starting to do whatever is right in their own eyes. It's like the wild, wild west. Or, in biblical terms, judges, where everybody does what's right in their own eyes. And it does not go well for a society when that happens. So as Isaiah talks about, there's a breach in the generation, a broken down wall. You have parents that are stabbing in the dark to try to figure out how should we parent, what should we do, and they've forgotten how to do it, and, uh, and oftentimes there's this um, really tense reactivity, so they don't want to listen to what someone else has to say. Maybe they watched how they parented. No, I'm not going to do any of that. So 
there's this sense in which we really need to apply ourselves to the wisdom of Scripture and what it has to say, in particular about discipline. Why discipline? Before I move on into the study, um, because I think that's the issue these days. Maybe in past generations it hasn't been. Um, maybe uh, a, a lack of real cherishing love where fathers and mothers spent time with their children doing what those children wanted to do. Uh, but I see now more and more an actual rejection of any kind of real discipline happening. And it's not between love and discipline, but actually I would call it love through discipline. Um, we read in the Proverbs that uh, he who neglects to do uh, discipline, to discipline his son, actually hates his son. And when you think about some of the things I've said here, it's so true. Uh, you don't want to not discipline your children and then have them have an obscured view of who God is. It's not a loving thing to do. So I really believe that, um, I don't believe all discipline is loving, but I think we ought to love our, dis our children through godly discipline. So let me read uh, Ephesians. We're here in Ephesians. It's no surprise and, and not at all by accident that the right after defining the roles of husbands and wives, we turn immediately into parenting, and Paul turns towards parenting. This is Ephesians 6, verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with the promise, that it may go well with you, that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. So as soon as we get done talking about the roles that husbands have, Husbands are method acting uh, the role of Jesus Christ to the church, and wives are method acting the role of church to Jesus Christ. As soon as we get done with that, we turn towards parenting and children. And this is not primarily a sermon towards children, but if you are, and we are all children, the uh, command to honor your father and mother never actually ends in our life. I still feel commanded to honor my father and mother. It has changed. I am now the husband of one wife, my, only, my own family, uh, I have my own family, and so um, there's a degree of authority and responsibility God has given me that my parents are no longer in charge of. I'm, I'm beyond that age, but I still believe there's great blessing in honoring your father and mother, and that is not dependent on your mother and father's behavior. There is a way to honor poor fathers and poor mothers by not constantly cursing them the way we talk. It's so easy to tear our parents down. So easy. And now that I think about it, it's like, man, it's so easy for me to say things. Uh, actually, it's not for me. I, I got to take that back. I think it's easy to tear down parents who didn't do a very good job. It's, I can't find a whole lot of things that my parents did wrong, and that's a huge blessing. But it's so easy to tear down with our words in general, especially towards our parents. So I want you to think about the idea that um, you might actually, even with parents that were not good parents, consider the ways in which um, they did well. Maybe your dad was absent, but did he actually provide for the family? Maybe the very thing that you wished he hadn't done was also something that had some good benefits. You had food and clothes. You know, there are fathers that don't provide even that. So thinking about the good things your fathers and mothers did is um, a way to honor them. I now think about what my children might say about me you know, and I hope they go easy on me. I hope they, they remember and focus on the things I did well rather than the things I did, did poorly. But I want to focus on and move forward to this verse, fathers do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Uh, for the most part, the vast majority of time in Christian circles is spent with children and their mothers. And so mothers have a huge role in training up their children. But the reason why Paul addresses the fathers here is what we just got done hearing in chapter 5. They're the heads of the families, they're the spiritual leaders, and they're the ones that, that God comes to about these kinds of issues like discipline. So the very first thing I want to say is if you're a father or a future father, if you don't have children, by the way, uh, I really wish I had thought more carefully and listened more carefully to sermons like this before I got married. They will be very valuable uh, to really look at what Scripture says about that. So if you don't have kids, don't turn tune out Listen now, and you'll have such a better time when you end up having uh, kids of your own. Um, but it's really ultimately the father's responsibility. He sets the tone and culture of a family of how that discipline is going to happen. Now, um, he doesn't do that in a dictatorial way. Again, we do that the way Jesus leads the church. Uh, in fact, Jesus commands us to do things, but I've never experienced him apply force. In fact, oftentimes the opposite. He 
helps me want to do the thing that he wants to do. So my wife and I would sit down. And by the way, some of this sermon is just practical, uh, experiential teaching where this is what's worked for me and this is what hasn't uh, based on these verses. And one of the first things we did was we discussed uh, whether we were going to spank our children or not. That's really the controversial thing. Um, I want to read uh, one or two uh, verses from um, Proverbs. One I've already read, but I just want to read it again here. Do not withhold discipline from a child. If you strike him with a rod, he will not die. If you strike him with a rod, you shall save his soul from Sheol. Another one here in Proverbs um, 22 is, uh, Folly is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline drives it far from him. So there's the sense in which discipline, another one that you've heard many times, uh, if you neglect the rod, he who neglects disciplining his son with the rod hates him kind of thing. So these are not hyperboles. These are not the Bible saying something other than that. It really is corporal discipline. I thought I'd talk about that because uh, there are just sort of gloomy ideas around. You know, you, you read uh, articles on mainstream media and there's, you know, scientists coming out with brand information about how it's so harmful to spank your children in any way. And it's, oh, it's child abuse. And here's the thing. It's literally not in Oregon. This is a statute from Oregon law. Uh, uh, point five says, is spanking child abuse? Spanking is generally not abuse. That's what Oregon law says. Listen to this. However, a spanking that leaves marks or bruises on a child might be abuse. Oregon law recognizes a child's right to be free from physical abuse, but also recognizes the right of parents to discipline a child. Therefore, reasonable discipline, reasonable discipline, which is defined here as spanking without leaving marks, without non-abusive spanking, reasonable discipline does not constitute child abuse unless it results in the type of harm described above. Okay, so according to Oregon law, wonderfully, it's not abuse to actually spank your children. Now, I want to talk about this idea before I even go to the practical part of what I was going to say with this, Christine. I, there's some biblical foundations that we need to think about beforehand uh, about why there would be these kinds of disciplines. Spanking is the most severe thing we do in terms of discipline, and so it's only the most severe kinds of behaviors that gets that. But there's a couple things that we, my wife and I, know about children before we ever even consider doing this, and I want to read to you uh, about children and about their nature. So children are born sinners. It's the first thing you need to understand. Reject that. You're going to have to reject most of what Scripture says about disciplining children. Because if you basically think they're good on the inside and you just have to coax that good out, you know, you'll have a bunch of talking sessions with your four-year-old when they're defying, defying you. Um, and there's just this foolishness to do that kind of thing. But here's what Scripture actually says. This is David speaking. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Uh, Children are natural born sinners. Uh, we had a daughter, which just delighted my heart. I had four boys, thought, I guess we won't have any daughters. And then uh, we actually had Ariel. And Ariel is now walking around. And uh, she relates mostly uh, to uh, Elijah and Judah. Judah is the one right above her. And Elijah is just the one that she connects with the most. And he connects with most of her. And you can just watch Ariel being sinful uh, without, there's no possible way we taught her to do this because we teach the exact opposite. And it's, it's basically the sin of coveting. And, and it's the worst form of it too. And we all do it. Uh, and we need to, you know, ask God for help not to. But here's what, the, uh, uh, what Ariel will do. She'll see Judah with a toy. And it's a pretty normal story. She wants that toy. Okay? So oftentimes we get duplicates of things. We thought, well, if we get duplicates of things, then they'll all have the exact same toy. And so they don't have to fight over it. Not the case. There's a blue Lego laying on the ground, and there's a blue Lego, identical, even the same amount of nodes. And one of them is in Judah's hands. Which one do you think Ariel wants? She wants the one in Judah's hands. Okay? So sometimes I'll tell him, hey, just, just give her that one. And he's like, okay, reluctantly gives it. And behind my back, I give him the other blue one, and he snickers. Guess what Ariel wants now? That one, too. Okay? It's the kind of coveting where I don't just want whatever my neighbor has. I want to have it while he doesn't. I want, to have, I want to deprive him of the nice thing he has, and I want to have it by myself. That's in Ariel from the very beginning. That's there. They're natural born sinners. If you don't think there are, then the context for especially corporal discipline just seems outlandish and crazy. And like, wow, why would you ever do this? They're good. They don't need this. One of the reasons why our society is so easily uh, 
fooled into thinking the kids are good, is that there is a degree of innocence in children. It takes a while to get jaded. You know, if, if you don't forgive someone and then keep not forgiving people, you get more and more bitter, and uh, children have less of those kinds of experiences. And so there are concepts that children don't even know and don't even think about that really come from sort of developed evil. And so there's an innocence to a degree in children. Uh, I think it's happened in the meantime, but I can't remember. Uh, at least a year ago, I thought to myself, you know, I've never had one of my children tell me they hate me. Not once. I thought that would have happened by now. Um, and then they did, and I think it was a result of hearing some other kids say it. And I looked at him, it was Elijah, I think, he was really emotional, and he said that, and I said, you don't mean that. He goes, no, I don't. It wasn't really him. He didn't really, he didn't really hate me in that moment, and uh, I remember saying that to my parents and really meaning it, or at least thinking that I mean it. And if my dad had told me, no, you don't, uh, I was, yes, I do, you know, I'd have been so angry because he's not giving me my way. And uh, so <clears throat> there's, there's, a degree of innocence that comes with not having uh, picked up bad behaviors as a result of the world. But that's not the same thing as talking about their natural born sinners. It's not just nurture, it's nature. And scripture actually teaches that. Um, there's another thing. This is Proverbs 22.15. Let me see if I have it marked here. And Proverbs 22.15, actually I have it right here. Folly is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline drives it far from him. Now, uh, I want to tell you a couple stories about folly for my children. They're not the kinds of ones that would ever lead to discipline. It would be real weird and crooked to discipline them for this. It's mostly just funny. But to just explain the kinds of folly that you experience with children. Um, so, I don't think we were going through Matthew. Maybe it was in the children's ministry that we were talking about building our houses on the rock. Way back when. Probably three years ago or something. And then it came up in the children's app that uh, I used to do for a bedtime routine for Isaiah. And uh, we're talking about what it really means to build your house on the rock. It means really following the way of Jesus, building your, your life on Jesus. That's the unshakable foundation. And I think we might have been at the, um, the coast or something, and Christine will either write these down or text them to our family text thread. And then I asked her to retrieve some of them. And this is Isaiah saying, hey, Mommy, look at my sand house built on the rock. <laughs> No matter how much you teach him, he's going to build a sand house on the rock, right? And uh, another one. This is me trying to teach uh, both Isaiah and Elijah what to do in a situation where one of them is drowning. They hadn't yet learned how to, uh, how to swim. Uh, been diligent to teach them how to swim. Um, but now this is a, a little text that my wife sent explaining what happened. So um, this is me, Dad. Uh, so what do you do, Isaiah, if Elijah's drowning? And Isaiah says, I have to run to the house and tell you so he doesn't die from drowning. I didn't want them jumping in and then both drowning kind of thing. And uh, this was, oh, I remember. We were going to Guam, and we were staying at a mansion with all of the family, kind of family reunion kind of thing, at a really nice swimming pool. And so I was training them up. What do you do if someone goes in the swimming pool while the parents aren't watching kind of thing? And then I said to Elijah, Elijah, what do you do if Isaiah's drowning? And Elijah sighs and shrugs his shoulder and says, well, he'll be dead, so I have to come tell you. I was like, yeah, yeah, you do, uh, but you missed the point. <clears throat> um, so, you know, we laugh because those are silly kind of things. You know, mix a little bit of sin into that kind of folly, and I look at my kids, and there's like one major nightmare thing they could do in a particular room, you know. Maybe it's a vase that has water in it, and it could crack all over the floor and break, and uh, maybe the floor you could clean it up, but what if they broke it on top of the couch, and now it sinks into it? That's the thing somehow they'll find to do. The one nightmare thing in a room they'll somehow find to do. So there's folly bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline drives it far from them. So first foundation is children are natural born sinners. So you ought not to think that they're good and you're coaxing their good out of them. You're actually putting boundaries on the development of, uh, of the sin in their lives. That's really what uh, you know, behavioral modification discipline is about. But they're also prone to folly and discipline or uh, mischief. So you ought not to be surprised that even if you teach them the right thing, they're going to build a sand house on the rock instead, you know. And uh, no matter how much, I mean, they get it now, but I taught them, this was not the first time that I'd said this thing, and here's Elijah's still thinking that this is, uh, this is after the fact, drowning kind of thing. Um, another one is, children can be manipulative. A uh, story about Ezra, Christine prayed that he would be um, really uh, assertive, because otherwise he might get lost as a third wheeled wheel, and he became very assertive. So, Ezra does this less now, but it was more like when he was two years old, when he was just starting to learn how to talk. 
he would uh, basically get what he wants by making you think it was your idea, or he, he would like say things in that way. It's hard to explain, but basically, he tries to make it seem like yours idea. So like point to a pineapple, hey, pineapple. And I wouldn't bite, because the last thing I want to do is cut up the pineapple for him. And uh, Christine's more servant-hearted and wanted to. So Ezra go, and she goes, Ezra, would you like some pineapple? And he goes, sure, go ahead. Like it was her idea in the first place. You know, you do this over and over again. It's hard to explain. I don't have the exact words. But he would like get you to think that serving him was your idea. Uh, getting him the thing was your idea. And he didn't need to do that. We would have given him a pineapple anyway. So um, children know how to manipulate. And, and from a very young age, all of my children learned how to cry to get what they would want. So Christine and I decided that uh, when they cry, that's definitely when they won't get what they want. So the very thing that they want, even if they stop crying, you can't have it anymore because you cry to try to get it. And it's like, I can't have a candy, so they scream cry about it. So they know how to get their way from a very young age. And so if you understand those three things, children are natural born sinners, they're prone to folly, and they can be very manipulative. Um, you start realizing, and this is true for all children. You don't have the one children this, that child this isn't true for. Uh, if you think that, then you'll probably never discipline your children either. But if we start with those foundations, then we can actually move our way into godly discipline. And this is where I want to talk about some of the things that Christine and I have, uh, um, have decided to do as a family culture. We're uh, a rewards and consequences family. So if our children do something good, there are previously defined rewards that they can get for doing those good things. And we reward them even for things that most people would be like, well, that doesn't really deserve a reward. Uh, but we see, and this is basically how I look at how God relates to me, I don't really deserve any of his blessings, and oftentimes he'll give me, uh, he'll bless me for doing something that uh, is basically just what I already should, my duty, I should have already just done it, you know, and he'll bless me anyway for being obedient. So we do reward them, and that reward system really does work. Um, and we don't chastise them for wanting to do things for rewards because we see in Scripture oftentimes the encouragement to do something is actually the reward as the result of that. Uh, persecution is one of those. Persecution has the reward of blessing as a result of it. And so we shouldn't fear persecution because um, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. So I don't think you should do it with the wrong heart so you do this good thing only because you're going to get reward. But the reward being part of your motivation for doing it, it's very biblical. So I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But it's not enough all by itself. So we give consequences for misbehavior. We define that kind of misbehavior. Uh, you might ask, well, what do you spank them for? Uh, we uh, have lived on streets that are relatively safe, but every once in a while, some 17-year-old will be racing by in their car, and you never know when that's going to happen. And so we taught our children not to go on the street, and we told them, if you go on the street... Without us holding your hand, we will spank you. And uh, they knew what that meant already from other, other experiences. So um, <clears throat> that happened with almost every one of the children. They run right off the curb and try to go get a ball, and that's exactly when they could get hit by a car. So it's out of love that we gave them what we do as the most severe uh, spanking. Uh, I'm going to actually get real nitty-gritty here because I want you to know what we do, and I think no one ever talks about this, so I, I think it's worth it. And we already know that it's not abuse legally, so I'm in no trouble with the live stream. Um, it never left a mark, to my knowledge. Um, so we usually swat with the hand on their bottoms, but the worst kind of spanking, and a spanking, I, uh, I, I shouldn't do this, but I actually sometimes, it's not my advice, do the opposite. Uh, but I'll threaten with the spanking, hoping that they won't continue the behavior um, I would, I think it would be better probably just to say, hey, if you do that again, there'll be a consequence, there is, and then to get a spanking. I wouldn't use any kinds of threats as deterrents, um, because then oftentimes you don't follow through, and then the children learn, oh, it's just words, it's just threats. It's nothing worse than show it, telling God, or telling children the story about God that his disciplines are just threats. They're not just threats. He follows through on the way that he disciplines us. So we call it a spoon spanking. That's like probably the worst kind of spanking they can get. And a um, funny story, I still remember, I think it was, it was either Ezra or Elijah, and they knew they were getting a spanking, and they were in tears. And he looked at me, and they, he said, uh, is it going to be a mommy spanking or a daddy spanking? <laughs> and uh, evidently, I spank harder than Christine does. And so there's a degree. There's a degree. Uh, my major piece of advice about any kind of corporal discipline, or any discipline at all, is that 
It just needs to be severe enough to modify the behavior. And I don't think I've ever modified our children's behavior the very first time. Uh, with some children that are stronger willed, Ezra in this case, it takes longer. It, it, there's more negative experiences that, ha that you have to have. But what you're doing is you're negatively reinforcing bad behavior and you're positively reinforcing good behavior. And it's working. And it's work and you can, I'm not perfect by any means and neither is Christine, but you can watch our children and they will actually obey most of the time. Um, and that's because they know there's rewards and consequences for not doing that. It's working for us. It's, it's amazing in that way. There are things that are not working, but they're really the result of our own failures. And it's most often in the area of consistency. So sometimes I'm just being lazy. I know they've broken a boundary that gets a certain consequence. And they, uh, I just don't do it. I'm being lazy. You know, and then I have the gall to criticize my wife for doing the same thing. Uh, while listen to something, you're like, you should have given a consequence for that. And she's like, you don't always give the consequences. It's just not good to, to relate that way. But consistency is unbelievably important in disciplining your children. Um, again, because remember, you're telling that story about who God is, and God is perfectly consistent in his discipline. So regarding behavioral modification, uh, one thing that the closest thing to discipline that God does um, in relationship to adults that applies directly to parents, I think is the law. So he gives these rules in the Old Testament and you transgress that law and then here's the consequence. There is actually another kind of discipline that God gives that human beings can never give unless they're really truly evil in their minds. I want to read about this discipline in Hebrews 12. So here's what uh, the author of Hebrews says in Hebrews 12 verse 5. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My sons, do not regard the light, lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. So it's a matter of actually being a true child of God, to be disciplined by God. And we should receive that knowing that God's doing it because he loves us. Um, it is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them. This is uh, looking at the ideal. Obviously, there are situations where this is not the case. Shall we not much more be subject to the fathers of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good, that we may share in his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the, peace, yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness for those who have been trained by it. Now here's the interesting thing. This passage is not primarily about parenting, and it's also not really about being disciplined by God for your own adult misbehavior. It's actually an explanation of why God allows and even brings about suffering at times. So consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. Talking about Jesus. Had done no wrong, right? In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your own blood. Now talking about persecution, right? Your struggle against sin in the world, your struggle against your own sin, um, Jesus actually struggled against the temptation to sin to the point where he was shedding blood. A miracle happened in the Garden of Gethsemane. So there are times in which our struggle against sin and our struggle against understanding how God allows suffering in the world, the only explanation is that God is actually disciplining us. And it says about Jesus that he learned obedience through suffering. Obedience through suffering. Isn't that unreal? There was no disobedience in Jesus, and yet he learned obedience through suffering. So there are times where God will discipline us to build our character, that is, yes, riddled with sin, not as a result of our misbehavior, but still for the sake of our sanctification. And so we ought not to design situations in which our children are going to fail or cause them suffering just like that. But there's another sense in which God chaperones his adult children through the law. And that's one of the functions of the law is to chaperone evil, to not allow evil to grow beyond the boundaries of the law. And so God brings consequences when someone transgresses the law. That kind of discipline, I think, is analogous to the kinds of discipline we're doing to our children. We don't have the power to transform them like God does by using everything and anything that happens in life as a, a, 
as something that actually transforms their character. What we can do is discipline them in a way that modifies their behavior, that chaperones their behavior, and it will not be perfect. You will not be perfectly able to modify their behavior. But um, so far, I've experienced that my children's misbehavior and disobedience is directly linked to my disobedience as a parent. It's, it, they're like little mirrors, you know. If you bring, uh, you can basically expect that your, your children will behave based on the rules they were given. You, get, you, you, know, you watch a soccer game and there's no rules, it always devolves into chaos. You watch a soccer game and the rules are well facilitated, kids stay within the boundaries. There's always outliers like me that make that more difficult, but at the end of the day, you shouldn't throw up your hands and be like, well, I have no idea why my child's misbehaving. They're misbehaving because the discipline is not consequential enough to change the behavior. It's that simple. Um, and one of the most consequential kinds of disciplines you can give a child is a spanking, a corporal discipline. Uh, God knows what he's doing when he's saying, don't, don't not do that. Don't neglect to do that. Uh, it's not good. It's, it's not love. It's actually hate. And to that, I want to speak, uh, say one or two more things and then wrap up. It feels wrong to parents of my generation that I've talked to to discipline their children with corporal discipline. It feels unloving. The Bible says the exact opposite. It is loving to do that in a loving manner, right? You're not doing it in anger. You're not losing your temper. But you're doing that in a biblical manner with preset guidelines that they, and they've gotten warnings. They know what's going to happen if, if this thing happens next. My children are never surprised when they got a spanking. Um, but it's, it's loving spe specifically because it's telling them who God really is. That is who God really is. What's wrong with your discipline, if you uh, disagree with what God says, is really what's wrong with your view of who God is. Oftentimes, when it, a child wasn't disciplined, they grow into an adult that thinks something about God that's not true, and so they raise their children in a way that's not according to biblical standards. And so you have to really consider, is the discipline that I'm doing... By the way, the elders at our church are never going to prescribe or come down hard on you if you're not spanking. There's not going to be church discipline for doing that. We know that God has given you the authority and the responsibility to raise those children. We're overseeing the church. We're overseeing families, but we're not the heads of your household. Your husband is. So you have to decide this, and you have the right to decide it on your own. But we will guide and instruct uh, in these areas, and that's really what this sermon is. This is a sermon that all the elders agree on. We talked about this carefully beforehand. Um, but the question really is, you need to ask yourself on a practical basis, is your discipline actually modifying the behavior of your children? You're not capable of transforming them. You're not capable of doing that perfectly, so they always act perfectly. But you are capable of being consistent and giving consequences that actually change behavior. Uh, that's, that's really key uh, in doing that. Um, one more thing that I want to say that I've seen uh, before I close in prayer here. This is hyper-practical advice. Uh, happens to parents. It's I think I'll see some knowing smiles. Um, let's say you get an inconsistent rhythm of disciplining. And so your children are misbehaving and uh, you're just not as being consistent. And, and they may even start seeing the inconsistencies and taking advantage of that. I feel like children are like little raptors that are like checking the fence for weaknesses at times, especially the strong-willed ones. They find one place where it's not electrocuted and that's where they'll go, you know. So you've been inconsistent that way, and now you find that your children are totally misbehaving, and, and it catches you off guard. It wasn't like you were consciously being inconsistent. And you start getting frustrated at your children, frustrated at your husband, frustrated at your wife. And, and then that, that keeps going on, and, and all of a sudden you find yourself disliking your child or children that are misbehaving. And then they do one more thing and it's the last wrong, and you haul off and you give them a spanking, or you haul off and give them some huge uh, grounding or consequence, right? Um, that misbehavior, if you wind it back, is a result of your inconsistency in disciplining them. The reason why you dislike your child's behavior is because you're doing the opposite of what you're supposed to be doing. But it's so easy to happen. It's so easy to happen that you start end up disliking your own children because of your own failures as a parent. And in that moment, you just need to be humble and recognize children of a certain age. You know, this is changes for, I think, uh, uh, kids in teenage years. Once they start being able to think abstractly, I think a lot of this changes. But for young children, their behavior is just a mirror of your parenting most of the time. Um, it's not always the case, right? I didn't teach Ariel to covet and steal things and want things while other people don't have things. 
uh, that was natural. But much of their behavior is a result of the boundaries they were given, the inconsistency in those boundaries they were given, and so on. So we're out of time for now, but um, I hope that was helpful. I hope you're able to see how Scripture actually teaches these very things about even corporal discipline. If you remember nothing else from the sermon, remember that your discipline tells a story about who God is. Either gives them a clear lens through which to see him or an obscured lens. Your, another thing you can remember is your discipline uh, can either build up a society or tear it down. And, um, and lastly, maybe my most practical advice about discipline is that it ought to modify the behavior of the child. If it doesn't, it's probably not biblical discipline. So with that being said, let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time of teaching. This felt more like a teaching than really a sermon. I hope that it was incredibly helpful for people. These are some of the things that I've learned biblically and in experience. And I ask that uh, people would be able to go apply the things that are according to their convictions. I pray that they would have the freedom at Boone's Ferry to develop their own convictions and, uh, and to be encouraged rather than constantly criticized. But I ask that you would bring us all into agreement with what your word actually says about raising children, in particular the subject of discipline. And I pray that we would be able to witness to these children who you are through our parenting. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.